Hello and welcome everyone. I am Coach Castle and today I'll be doing a comparison of compound versus isolation movements. In particular I'll be addressing the squat. So let's go ahead and get into it. To begin with, a person who is unfamiliar with biomechanics might assume that exercises which allow them to lift a heavier weight would produce more mass or larger muscles. But this is an incorrect and unscientific assumption, not based in fact. I would also like to add that you use science in your everyday life consciously or unconsciously, almost on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, unquestionably. That is because it improves and makes life more efficient. Yet, when it comes to exercise, and only exercise, do we allow emotions to become involved. Most trainers, coaches, and gym rats allow traditions, magazined, misplaced bro logic, and genetic freaks to guide their training, even if it goes against all scientific evidence, simply because they don't know better. Now, a muscle that is participating in a compound exercise is being assisted by other muscles in lifting the weight. A unified effort, or multiple muscles participating simultaneously in one lift, will naturally allow a heavier weight to be lifted. But, each participating muscle may not be working at its individual maximum capacity. A unified effort from a group of muscles does not automatically cause each muscle to work more intensely than would a lone muscle, but with a lighter load. In fact, during a compound exercise, some muscles may be working at 90% of their maximum effort, while others may only be working at 70% or even 50% of their maximum effort. This is determined by the mechanics of each exercise, not by the person's choice or if they believe themselves to be feeling the muscle. Oftentimes, during a compound exercise, a muscle we most want to prioritize is actually less loaded than a muscle which we do not want to prioritize. This is due to the mechanics of that particular exercise. Now, each muscle could be fully loaded and be worked with 100% efficiency using an isolation exercise, even though the weight used would be much lighter than the weight used during a compound exercise. It is important to understand the difference between lifting heavy weights and optimally loading a given muscle. An individual muscle can be loaded more, even though a lighter weight is being lifted, if it is not assisted by other muscles if it has better alignment, if the resistance curve is more ideal, or if a longer lever is being used. Now, an individual muscle could be loaded less during a compound exercise, even though a heavier weight is being lifted because of these same exact variables. Now, if we were to speak on the squat purely as a muscle building exercise for the quadriceps, hamstrings, and glutes, it is not efficient. just to speak on the quadriceps muscle alone, during exercise, it could not possibly know against which type of resistance they are having to work. It could be that one's body weight is being pulled downwards by gravity, and that is the load, while the tibia is pushing the body upwards and away from the ground, like doing a squat. Or it could be that the weighted platform of a leg press machine is being pushed towards one's torso, and the tibia is pushing the platform away from the torso. Either way, the quadricep is doing the one and only thing it can do, which is to extend the knee, its only function. In both cases, something is stationary or fixed, either the ground or the seat of the leg press. Whichever is not stationary is moving away from that which is. Either way, the muscle function is the same. It extends the knee. To use a different example, the pectorals would not know whether a push-up is being done or a barbell bench press is being done. In the first case, the pectorals are pulling the humerus towards the sternum, which causes the hands to push downwards against the ground, which causes the body to rise. In the second case, the pectorals are pulling the humerus towards the sternum, which causes the hands to push upwards against a barbell, which causes the barbell to rise. But in both cases, the pectorals are doing the exact same thing, pulling the humerus towards the sternum, which is where the origin of the pectorals are situated. In either case, the humerus is adducted in a forward direction. There is absolutely no difference between the two, 
assuming the weight of the barbell is equal to the percentage of body weight that occurs during a push-up and the direction of resistance is the same. The point I'm making is that the fitness community have been naively taught to believe that lifting a large amount of weight in a single compound exercise, like squats or deadlifts or bench press, is essential. They have been brought into and repeated the same illogical notion over and over again, that strength cannot be gained during lifts that load only one or two muscles at a time, and that only the multi-joint, multi-muscle exercises build strength. It truly is the blind leading the blind. Now this stems from the misguided belief that if a large amount of weight is not being lifted at one time, then strength is not being built. Well, here we have conflated two concepts. Lifting a large amount of weight during a squat or deadlift or leg press, etc. Or the concept of being strong with well-developed muscles. These are not the same thing. You do not have to squat or deadlift heavy weights in order to be strong and have well-developed muscles. Furthermore, we should not be so naive as believing that our obsession with performing a heavy squat, deadlift, or bench press is really about developing strength. The world's obsession with that is based largely on measuring up, about meeting others' expectations or exceeding them. In other words, we are irrationally concerned about whether or not our physical strength, as a measure by those particular lifts, is adequate, superior, or below standard as compared to others. But even the concept of being stronger than someone else even if the person is our same size, is very misguided and misunderstood by all. This is due to proportion size of body levers. Just because two people are the same size does not mean that their bones are the same size. A person with different size levers will, of course, have different loads placed upon their muscles. And this is not even to mention the fact that everyone has a different genetic makeup of muscles and muscle groupings a mix of fast twitch and slow twitch that is genetic and unchangeable. The only things that matter are that your strength be improved as efficiently as possible with no damage to your body, so that recovery can be optimized. How your strength compares with that of others is completely irrelevant. The human body is essentially a machine that is made up of levers or bones, pulleys or muscles, and pivots or joints. Therefore, Every movement and every force placed upon this human machine is quantifiable and should be evaluated exclusively on the basis of physics and natural human motion, or biomechanics. The fitness industry has been biased for years in favor of certain power or compound movements that have been revered throughout the ages, but can easily be discredited by way of biomechanical analysis. The fitness industry has been biased for years against isolation exercises, even though these movements allow for each joint and muscle to operate in a perfect and natural way. They also allow more efficient loading of an individual target muscle as compared with compound exercises and reduce the risk of damage. When all skeletal muscles are individually strengthened, a person's total body strength is every bit as useful and functional as it would be if those muscles were strengthened by ways of a compound exercise. But with far less time spent on training, far improved recovery ability, far more efficient gains resulting from maximally activating your muscles, no skeletal or joint damage or discomfort, and less central nervous system stress. So, as an example, let's talk squats in terms of efficiency. Squats specifically as a quadriceps exercise. So, the primary objective when performing weighted squats is to work the quadriceps followed closely behind by the glutes. So the questions you have to ask yourselves are, how active is the lower leg as the operating lever of the quads and the upper leg as the operating lever of the glutes? Well, the tibia, or the lower leg bone, is tilting forward about 30 degrees from vertical, 60 degrees, during a standard back squat. So this would translate to about a 33% tilt, or 30 divided by 90 degrees, Therefore, we could say that the tibia is working with about 33% efficiency. The femur, or the upper leg bone, is slightly below horizontal. So, this lever could be called a 100% lever. 
The torso is tilting about 30 degrees from vertical, 60 degrees. Therefore, we could say this lever is also about 33% active. 30 divided by 90. The higher the percentage of active a lever is, the greater the percentage of the available resistance that will be loaded onto the muscle that operates the lever. Keep in mind, however, that the available resistance also factors in the length of the lever. For this reason, the glutes are not getting quite as much benefit from a squat as it would appear. Now, even though the femur is 100% active when in the descended position, like above, it is being effectively shortened by the doubling back of the tibia, where it folds over itself. So, the glutes are working with a femur that is operating with about half its actual length in this scenario. Therefore, the femur is delivering 100% of a reduced loads to the glutes. The tibia is about 33% efficient in the descended position of the squat, so it is only loading approximately 33% of the available resistance onto the quadriceps. So, if you like, let's do a math. Stay with me for a moment. Let's say a man is squatting with 225 pounds on his back. His primary goal is to work his quadriceps, followed closely behind by his glutes. His body weight is 200 pounds, but only three quarters of that is the weight above his legs. So, let's figure that he is effectively squatting 150 pounds of his body weight, plus his body weight is 200 pounds, but only three quarters of that is the weight above his legs. So. Let's figure that he is effectively squatting 150 pounds of his body weight plus 225 pounds. That will give us 375 pounds total. Since his tibia length has a magnification factor of approximately 20 times, we'll multiply 375 by 20. This will give us a total of 7,500 pounds and then multiply that by his 33% lever efficiency factor. It brings it down to 2,475 pounds total. Now you divide that by his two legs, which then equals 1,238 pounds per quadricep using that lever. This may sound like quite a lot load on each quadricep. However, as we'll soon see, it's not as much load as it could be, and the energy cost is also much higher than it should be. The forward tilt of his torso is like that of the tibia. So, it is effectively active as the lever that is the lever that loads the quads. However, his torso is a longer lever than his tibia, so it is magnifying the resistance more than the lever that load the quads. The barbell is resting at the very top of the torso lever, allowing the entire length of the torso to be magnifying the forward force of the 225 pound barbell. This means that his erector spinal, the muscle operating the torso level, are loaded more than are his quads even though this exercise is not meant to be an erector spinal exercise. So here's where we should ask, isn't there a way of getting a greater percentage of the available resistance to load onto the quads and less onto the erector spinal and the spine? Simple answer is yes. Simply by changing the direction of the resistance so that the tibia, or the lower leg, interacts more perpendicularly with resistance than it does during barbell squats. So, to make it even simpler, Let's look at another example that uses a fully active lever for the quads rather than a 33% active lever. We'll talk about leg extensions. In order to achieve optimal exploitation of the resistance movement, our knees should face the axis of the drive wheel. In knee extension, all four heads are active. In the left side, we see movement in an open kinematic chain where the legs are free to move. In the right, we see the movement is a closed kinematic chain, where the legs are fixed and not free to move. Therefore, if we use intense force, it will be knee extension that elevates the body. Leg extensions on a leg extension machine, as it applies, its resistance is 100% perpendicularly against the lower leg, making the lower leg a 100% active lever. So, if one is using only 150 pounds, 75 pounds per ankle, it would load each quadricep with 1,500 pounds total approximately. Compare that to the 1,238 pounds each quadricep would be getting when squatting 225 pounds and consider the difference in cost between the two. 
Leg extensions are much more efficient at delivering load to the quads because less weight used still equals more load on those quads. You see, the reason why a person is able to squat with so much weight is precisely because of the inefficiency of the tibia angle, 33%, combined with the shortened femur length caused by the doubling back of the lower leg. You're folding your levers. If the goal is simply to move the most amount of weight, even though it doesn't load any of the muscles involved as efficiently as possible, then by all means doing heavy squats and leg presses and deadlifts are fine, as you're simply doing them to stroke your ego. But for the purpose of building muscle, it would be much wiser to use the better mechanics. You can load the target muscles more with less weight and put less stress on the bones, joints, and non-targeted muscles, meaning no muscle soreness, quicker recovery, no damage to your joints, no damage to your cartilage or your spine, no lower back pain, no shoulder discomfort, the list is endless.